We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, any members of the Senate that would like to sit at the table, please do. Uh, you're welcome to sit here at the table. Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, we um, we want to do meet today to get more information about what is going on with PERS. We've had some PERS hearings already this year, and uh, but we haven't spoken with the board. Uh, we wanted to meet with the PERS board. We wanted to hear from y'all. Um, I think over the last few days, we've heard from many of y'all probably in this room. I know I've gotten to catch up with middle school and high school teachers, uh, lifelong friends that I haven't seen in a few years, and uh, even a couple of cousins. Uh, that have reached out to me recently, so uh, so it hasn't been um, it hasn't been a, a bad experience. It's been great to get to catch up with some people. But but that being said, um, I think that's the same for most senators in the body, and especially the ones on this committee. And and uh, I, I believe I speak for all of us on the committee that we hear you, we understand, we all have close relationships with people that are are PERS retirees or current employees. Uh, we care about making sure that your benefits are paid. And uh, I think that there's been some questions about the, the, uh, how stable the PERS is. And, and we would just like to get more information on that and, and better understand. And so that's the purpose of today. We, um, you know, under Lieutenant Governor Hoseman's leadership, we've moved to more transparency. So this will be live streamed. It'll also be available uh, via YouTube after the fact. Um, and, and transparency is what we want from today. We, um, we want to better understand so that we can make a more informed decisions to both protect retirees and their benefits or current employees and their future benefits, as well as taxpayers in Mississippi. And so with that, we're going to get started with the meeting. Uh, this meeting has actually been scheduled for about a month because we do have a speaker uh, that is zooming in with us um, that we've had scheduled for about a month. And so we're going to have that to begin with, and then we're going to transition to uh, Mayor Toby Barker from Hattiesburg, that's the MML president, and then we have three board members from PERS with us today uh, that we're going to hear from um, uh, a little bit later. So with that, uh, we'll get started with um, Dr. Cass Sunstein, uh, who is, uh, in a, is with Harvard uh, Law School. He is a, um, he's a former regulatory um, director with the Obama administration. He's written several books, including Nudge and Sludge. Um, he's also written plenty more, including one about Star Wars, which I'm, I have not yet read, but, but I'm looking forward to reading at some point. And uh, with that, Mr. Sunstein, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, sir. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, for how long would you like me to speak? I'm happy to answer questions also. Uh, 20 to 30 minutes, okay with you? Okay, that's great. Uh, I'll try to hold your attention. So uh, so these remarks and my focus on the topic, which is administrative burdens, uh, is the product of, uh, let's just say, incomplete success on my part in one of my several stints in the federal government. And I say incomplete success uh, as a euphemism for a slightly more severe word. And the problem is that in the United States at the federal level, uh, the number of burden hours placed on the American people is extremely high. Um, it is in the billions, and we're speaking of hours imposed on students, hours imposed on teachers, hours imposed, uh, imposed on administrators in Mississippi and elsewhere, hours imposed on nurses and doctors and hospitals, all over our country, hours imposed on truck drivers, hours imposed on would-be recipients of federal funds, either because they are individuals who need those funds or because they are state governments or private organizations who have a legal right to such funds, or people who are seeking to get workers, perhaps because they need them in a tight labor market, or people who are seeking uh, to do some public service. So we're talking about billions of hours and paperwork burdens. And there's a federal law called the Paperwork Reduction Act. Uh, he, a proposition is that every state should have a Paperwork Reduction Act. And if it is fully realized, the toll taken, let's call it a time tax on the American people could be greatly reduced. And doing that would be uh, 
a, a great blessing for uh, economic growth, for vulnerable people, from people who are uh, job creators, who are not particularly vulnerable, but who are often stymied in their efforts. So that's the kind of background problem I'll identify. And let me, with your indulgence, uh, say a few things that will be verging on the academic uh, real, but academic, about why uh, administrative burdens, sometimes referred to as sludge, is so, um, uh, uh, so um, detrimental uh, to the American people. Um, the word sludge, which has, I hope, a kind of vividness, is designed to capture frictions between people and things that can make their life go better. So it might be waiting time before you get a permit. It might be a form that's 22 pages rather than seven pages. It might be an in-person interview requirement. Uh, it might be time spent on the phone or on the internet trying to arrange that in-person interview requirement. A notation for you is that a partial predictor of whether people are gonna be evicted from their homes is whether they live near the courthouse in which a proceeding is pending against them. Pause over that. It's not intuitive that whether people are going to be evicted from their homes uh, depends on part on whether they live the, near the courthouse. The reason is the time spent getting to a court that's far away is sometimes a wall between people and uh, a hearing. So they just won't attend. And if they don't attend, then they'll get an eviction notice. If the court is proximate, then they will attend. And the judge will say, okay, landlord, okay, tenant, why don't you work it out together in a way that you two find agreeable? And that way people won't be evicted. The time spent having to get to the courtroom is sludge. This morning, I was with my wife trying to get passport renewal for our 14-year-old son. We had to go someplace that wasn't terribly proximate, and the State Department is doing the best it can, but the process that people face there is just an illustration of sludge. Okay, we know that if you are a company, let's say a small business in Mississippi or Texas or Oregon, and you have to do seven things in order to commence operations. It might be that even if you're kind of just running all the numbers, uh, you might think, I, I can't handle that, which might have any number of unfortunate effects. It might mean that people handle it not now, but in a month, which means that those people and the people who benefit from their activity are uh, stalemated. It might mean that they won't do it at all, in which case we'll have a compliance problem and illegality. It might be they simply give up on the relevant enterprise, which is an individual and social uh, tragedy. The magnitude of the tragedy depends on the person, but it is a tragedy for someone to give up on something because sludge stands in their way. We know that the problem of sludge is actually worse than intuition suggests, because if people are really busy, if people are a little bit sick, if they are elderly, if they're struggling with an economic problem, short-term or long problem, or, or short-term or long-term, their ability to navigate sludge is much more severe than it would otherwise be. Bear with me for a moment. Let me dig into that a bit. There's research on sludge, understood in administrative burdens. It's not a story from Mississippi. It's a story from elsewhere in the United States about uh, a, an elderly gentleman who was wrestling with 22 pages of forms to get benefits that he needed in order to live a decent life. And his self-report of dealing with those benefits, and maybe everyone listening, this will resonate, uh, combined a sense of humor, he's funny, and a sense of outrage, he's upset. And he says, I'm 87 years old. You're asking me to fill out this many pages of forms now? I can't see so well. Maybe when I was 40, I could have done it. But now that I'm 87, I'm supposed to do this? Now that story can be told for 
people who are struggling maybe with cancer, maybe with heart disease, maybe with uh, some sort of cognitive decline because they're elderly. Maybe they just can't see particularly well. Maybe they're anxious. Maybe they're having some depression. And in a case like that, the consequence of sludge for people is uh, excruciating. I was engaged with some students in the recent past and asked them how the, their, their university was handling their health issues. And one of them actually said, well, I need, need help. I have an anxiety problem and I needed to see a doctor. But the amount of sludge I had to wade through that the state government imposed was so severe that I started to get really anxious. And then I gave up. And he was laughing as he was saying this, but the story is only half funny. It's also half a terrible story. Okay, we know that people often are a little focused on today and tomorrow and not so much focused on next week or next month or next year. We know that people often procrastinate, that they put things off. And that means that sludge can often be a wall between people and something that can turn their lives and the lives of people around them in a much better direction. And I'm thinking now of economic growth and places that are facing challenging levels of economic growth, in part because of administrative burdens. Let me talk about a few things that have been done by the federal government, which is the government I'm most familiar with, that are designed to cut sludge. Um, some government agencies have done the following. They've just required, either through legislation or through executive direction, that entities come up with three to five initiatives to reduce sludge within 60 days. Very non-directive, very simple, three to five initiatives within 60 days. And what's beautiful about that is that it tries to enlist the creativity of people who are working for government, maybe are themselves frustrated. It gives their initiative pride of place and it's not directive at all. They can come up with whatever they want. If the three to five that they come up with are very weak and they do, don't do much, then they know that's not a source of great pride. And so they probably won't do that. So I know parts of the US government where the three to five initiatives in short order has paid huge dividends. It's a low cost initiative on the part of those who uh, inaugurate it. And for the part on the part of those who participate in it, it's maybe the highlight of their professional year because they get to do something that helps the people with whom they work um, have a much better week or month. A second thing that can be done is to, for either the legislature or the executive to be a little more directive and to say, here are five specific things we want you to do. We want you to shift from annual reporting to uh, every four year reporting or from quarterly reporting to every year reporting or from paper transmission to electronic transmission or from um, uh, a 12 page form to a one page form or to a short form option for people who are designed with a number of forms. There's an initiative the US government undertook in this vein and it seems very simple, but it's a big deal where truck drivers had to report on the safety of their cars at the close of business and at the next morning. And truck drivers said, why do we have to do it when all we've been doing in between is sleeping? Why do we have to inspect our cars again? Nothing happened, it was just in the driveway. And the truck drivers saved a lot of time as a result of the elimination of the redundant requirement and that cut time taxes. So a list maybe of three or four things and people on the ground will know what they are that people should initiate is one strategy. The Department of Homeland Security in the United States did um, uh, a different thing, which is to say, we're going to cut 20 million hours in paperwork burdens in a year. Eliminate 20 million hours 
in paper or burdens in a year. And when the department did that, it was keenly aware that its own paperwork burden was in the vicinity of 190 million. So it was cutting approximately 20%. That was a very ambitious goal. It's not three to five initiatives. It's not strategies, a list of strategies. It's a number. And the number was uh, met where the creativity of public officials unleashed to reduce paperwork burdens produced north of 21 million hours in burden reduction. So one idea is three to five, another idea is directed means, a third idea is a numerical target. A fourth idea is, and you all would have you know, a, a, a extraordinary knowledge about this, to know where in Mississippi is the government biting hardest in terms of time taxes imposed on the citizens of Mississippi? Is it people who have health care challenges? Is it people who are trying to meet health care challenges? Is it developers trying to produce something? And once there's a list, maybe a catalog of four priority areas that people who are on the ground observing the toll taken by sludge, then we have a policy reform that can be extraordinary. So I'll describe one thing in a country that is English speaking, but not the United States, where I know they had a terrible backlog with respect to um, something where people needed to apply. Let's just say for current purposes, it was passports. The idea was to extend the time from 10 years to 11 years. That would extend, the, that would, that's what they would do. And that would eliminate the backlog like that. It went away. A very long backlog was eliminated. That was a response to a particular problem. In the United States, USCIS has extended work authorization for certain persons from 180 days to 540 days, knowing that these are workers that employers really need and that it's not in anyone's interest for the relevant workers cleared to work to be in a shelter rather than helping grow our economy. And the shift from 180 days to 540 days uh, has been a, a massively beneficial shift where it's not on the headline of any newspaper, but employers all over America are saying, uh, thank goodness. Uh, we know that carrying around a driver's license is not at all a bad thing, but it's a real convenience for many to have a driver's license on their phone. Uh, some states have done that, and the U.S. government has made that possible as an initiative that will reduce sludge for many people and make travel easier. You might know about, I hope you do know about, TSA Pre, which makes the uh, travel experience much faster. Uh, the security process is really rapid in most airports and for international travel, those global entry which is basically a sludge reducer for Americans known to be trusted travelers. I'm thinking we need global entry equivalents all over state and local government, where something that is a long process, where people have to meet multiple clearance requirements can be turned in for relevant population into a very short process where you have the equivalent of a kiosk that lets you go. Okay, so th this is an assortment of ideas, and I'll end by uh, drawing your attention to an executive order that's a candidate for the most popular executive order in the last uh, decade, though you can't hear the applause, and I think I know why you can't hear the applause. It's an executive order on customer service uh, from the current president, which draws on bipartisan ideas that have developed over a roughly 30 year period for reducing time taxes. And the reason can't hear the applause is that everyone likes it and is grateful for it and is going on to more high profile items while this is working. And this you can see an assortment of fully baked uh, policy reforms that come from all around the federal government, whether it's about Veterans Affairs 
and helping veterans get the benefits and help to well, which they're entitled, or whether it's about farmers and reducing bar burdens and barriers that farmers face that are um, uh, have not been adequately attended to even to this day, but are more adequately attended to by virtue of this executive order. One last idea for you, which comes from uh, an initiative which has informed many of the reforms I've just described, which is outreach to the people who are adversely affected by sludge of the sort that I know this committee does all the time. And there are multiple vehicles for doing that. The US government has things like federal register notices, which doesn't get don't get people's blood racing in a good way. Typically, it's kind of technical stuff. But a federal register notice from one part of the government asking for identification of barriers and burdens elicited 7,400 reform proposals from the American people. And the government poured over those 7,400 and acted on many. There are listening session opportunities. There are websites where people can write in. And this activates the knowledge and the really the wisdom of the American people in the interest of making government work better. And that's really uh, the foundation for all of this. So the basic idea is that if we've learned anything, I think, from the COVID experience, whatever their disagreements people have, there's one thing we've learned, whether we hate lockdowns or like lockdowns. And that is that the most precious thing that the American people have is a four letter word and it's time. Let's find, shall we, ways to give citizens of our Republic more of that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate you spending your time with us today. And I know you don't have much time left, but if you don't mind, I'd like to ask and see if the committee has any questions or any other members of the Senate. Anyone at all? Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm always amazed at some of the um, constituents that reach out, that ask for help with different things in state government that oftentimes a phone call from a legislator can solve quickly yet they've struggled to get it done. And we are grateful for all the opportunities we can find to reduce the sludge for constituents to take care of things uh, for themselves without having to reach out to us um, because they can't get anywhere on their own. And, um, and so we would like to continue to work on that in this committee. And that's what the drive for this committee is. Uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, hope to catch up with you again soon. Would love that. It's a great honor to be able to speak to you, and it's inspiring to see your attention to this. Thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. All right, at this time, I will transition to PERS, and uh, I think our first person up is Mayor Toby Barker. Uh, he is also limited in time, so he's just going to share with us a few thoughts that he has um, before he has to get back to Hattiesburg, I believe. Will you push the button on the microphone? I think we all are limited in time so we don't get caught out caught outside after uh, giving our testimony so uh thank you mr chairman and members of the committee and first i'd like to commend you mr chairman and the lieutenant governor and his staff for the political courage in holding this hearing in the first place and for your transparency throughout this process as a former legislator i know that pers is a four-letter word particularly when talking about it at this capitol and especially when it involves any legislative directed change it is politically volatile, and that's unfortunate because it affects the livelihood of too many Mississippians for us not to have a conversation on its future. I'm Toby Barker. I serve as mayor of the city of Hattiesburg, and I also serve as this year's Mississippi Municipal League president. And our 290 member cities, towns, and villages appreciate the leadership of the legislature in moving a bill forward to address some of the issues of PERS. Mississippi municipal employees represent a significant number of PERS participants. MML supports efforts to protect the PERS system. We also feel a responsibility to voice concern when we see an unsustainable trend of shifting the burden of paying for PERS to employers, particularly cities, towns, counties, and school districts. It's no secret that the unfunded liability 
in PERS is a problem, and it's a storm that's been brewing for some time. We began voicing concern when the PERS board approved an increase in the employer contribution, uh, which is the amount that every state agency, city, county, and school district kicks in for each of its full-time employees from 17.4 to 22.4 in December 2022. I want you to rescind that in spring 2023 when cities and counties went into an uproar and the legislature threatened to take action. Then the PERS board approved that same increase late again late last summer, but phased in thankfully. And those phased in increases will be 17.4 to 19.4 in July of this year, 19.4 to 21.4 in July 2025, and 21.4 to 22.4 in July 2026. And many are reporting that going from 17.4 to 22.4 is simply a 5% increase uh, in that contribution for employee employers, but not so fast. Increasing the employer's share five points actually equates to a 28% increase in retirement costs for cities, counties, state agencies, and school districts. But there's more, because the PERS board also voted in that same August 2023 meeting to lower the assumed rate of return to 7%. And while I certainly understand the more conservative approach in the outlook, uh, the PERS executive director told the board that they should be prepared to continue raising the employer contribution to potentially 27.4% over the next five to seven years. 27.4%. For Hattiesburg, 27.4% means that we'll have to come up with close to 3 million more annually to cover retirement contributions for our existing employees. And my encouragement to you, to the committee, to any member of the legislature is before you simply go forward with the tried and true method of simply saying no when a lawmaker is bold enough to propose a PERS policy change is this. My encouragement first, is to please call your mayor, your county supervisor, or your school superintendent and ask them how much it will cost if and when they're having to pay 27.4% employer share on each full-time employee. Then ask your mayor, county supervisor, or school superintendent as to where they plan on finding that money. Raising property taxes? Yes, and probably multiple times. Cutting services and employees? Absolutely. Uh, which, by the way, makes the purse problem even worse because you have fewer public employees paid into the system. Raises for city and state employees, including first responders, at the, at the local level, that's doubtful at best. The truth is, though, that even the bill before you, House Bill 1590, as it stands, won't provide the permanent solution. And we as a municipal league are not saying that it will. However, as a municipal league, we support that part of it that would rescind the initial increase in employer contribution from 17.4 to 19.4, preventing a tax increase in some of your towns, counties, and school districts. And I've seen the alerts being shared on social media, particularly the line that says, and I quote, 2% of that much needed employer increase was scheduled for this year and House Bill 1590 blocks that increase in purse funding. Uh, the translation is the House listened to local elected officials who didn't wanna raise local taxes on their citizens in order to put yet another temporary patch on a growing problem, an unsustainable approach of solely leaning on employers to cover the unfunded liability or hoping that a fifth tier helps us in 25 to 30 years. And, but I'll close with this. I know hard decisions are ahead and I'm not sure what the exact solution is, but I do know that a long-term fix will likely require some shared sacrifice among all stakeholders. And it will also require trust and honesty among advocacy groups and lawmakers. And I appreciate both the House and the Senate or being the adults in the room and realizing that no, and stat or just status quo are not actual and viable strategies. Uh, because Mr. Chairman, members of the committee as someone who has sat in th that chair and has been on those appropriations conference committees, I will tell you that many who just want to stick with that philosophy of no, are in many cases the same people who will join in the criticism of not spending enough on many of the priorities that you have because they're having to cover increased employer contributions for those agencies. We all want PERS to be there, not only for our current retirees, but for our current employees and for our children and grandchildren who choose public service. However, we have an actual financial problem, one where what is being promised isn't matching up with the system's capacity to follow through on those promises. And it's easy for groups to send out alerts that stir people up and to call their legislators and just say no and, and hope and pray that we have several good years of good stock market returns so we can once again avoid the uncomfortable topic it's harder to have a real conversation, and regardless of how House Bill 1590 moves forward in its current form or another, and we do hope that some form does move forward uh, to prevent those local tax increases, I appreciate the House and Senate engaging in that conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here today. Next up, we have uh, Jay Smith. He's a PERS board member, uh, and I believe you're also superintendent of North Pike School District. Thank you very much for coming up and joining us today. Um, I have to tell you all, I, I text all three of the board members that are here today, Monday evening, close to nine, and, uh, and they all quickly committed to coming up here on such short notice, and I greatly appreciate y'all being here today. I think two of y'all came from Lee County, and you came from around... Yep, so thank you all very much. And, and uh, if you would just take a couple of minutes and briefly tell us about yourself, and then um, I'd like to open it up to the committee to ask questions and, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Do you mind double checking the mic and making sure it's green? about that. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Right. I'll just uh, repeat that if I could, Mr. Chairman, uh, we do thank you for the invitation this afternoon. We do greatly uh, appreciate that. Uh, my name is Jay Smith. I am the superintendent of the North Pike School District. I am not here representing the North Pike School District. I'm here as a board member of PERS. I was elected by the K-12 and community college uh, employees across the state. I have a vested interest in PERS, as most of you in this room do. Uh, my wife is an elementary principal. I have three children that are in classrooms as I speak, one in Pearl Public School District, one in Clinton, and one in Brookhaven. I also have a younger daughter that is at Mississippi College in the teacher education program, and she'll be entering PERS within the next year. So that is the main reason that I chose to run for the PERS board and represent uh, those, not only my family, but the constituents of the K-12 community. So that's... Um, a little bit about myself, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have been in PERS uh, for 31 years myself, starting back as a teacher in the Jackson Public School District uh, many years ago. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday, as, I, as I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chairman, uh, you did mention in your text messages in our communication last night that you wanted me to speak um, a little bit about the role that I believe as a board member, uh, as well as a little bit about how I make my decisions. I'm prepared to do that. I do want to just... Uh, briefly tell the audience that I am uh, the rookie on the board. I've not been there, but um, it'll be two years next month, month actually. So um, I can answer some of your questions and I will do my best to, to try to answer all of them. Uh, but I, I do want to make that point, uh, but I, I feel confident that I can at least uh, help the committee in some way today. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I have a few questions just because I'm not familiar. I, I, I'm very aware that the PERS board is elected, uh, or at least eight of you are. Um, can you walk me through um, how that process works? Uh, I believe you're for um, school and community college uh, employees. Is that accurate? Yes, sir, that is accurate. And those individuals within the K-12 community and the community college community, those that are full-time employees who contribute to PERS may vote in those elections and not only those individuals. So uh, that is the group that I represent. And, and how do you, uh, how many people is that? And, and how do you campaign for that? What, I just would like to know more about the process. Well, I, I will tell you the way that I campaigned for that really was through my children uh, and, and as, as well as my wife and through their social media. I do not have Facebook. Several of us did the same thing. <laughs> so uh, uh, that is the way that I campaigned. But uh, keep in mind with 31 years of experience, and working in several districts, I have been with a lot of people uh, over a lot of different geographical areas. And so um, I was pleased that I was elected with over 60% of the vote. Uh, but a lot of that, again, was just hard work through my kids who are in the classroom teaching and getting those school districts on board. So uh, that's probably the most honest answer I can give you on that. Um, so it's, it's really no secret or, or methodology to run, uh, but that's uh, just getting the word out. So um, like you mentioned, I'd, I'd asked you about um, decision making. Tell me what information you look at, how you come to a decision making process, go through the decision making process. Okay. Um, if I could, let me just kind of just go with you, go through my decision making process just a little bit. Uh, the first thing that, that I do as a new board member is I study the legislative peer review. And as you know, that's, that's the peer uh, that uh, reviews PERS every year. There's a lot of information in those reviews uh, that's historical. It talks a lot about more decisions and how those decisions have been made. Also gives you a lot of data on the uh, financial stability of PERS. So anytime there's an issue um, 
that I'm uncomfortable with, I usually start with that. Also, as a new board member, I spend a lot of time with terminology and trying to understand the terminology of not only uh, the investment community, but also the terminology of the board, because my board members have been on that board a long time. And they have a wealth of, line, a wealth of knowledge that um, I may not have. So I spend a lot of time learning the terminology so I can speak their language, so to speak. Uh, the next thing that I do is sometimes I look at what other states are doing on the topic at hand. And keep in mind, much of what we do in terms of our votes are just, um, I don't want to say um, insignificant votes, but a lot of them are routine. But on those major issues, like increasing uh, the 2% contribution rate, those type things. Then I listen very carefully um, in the meetings to our actuaries and those who do this for a living, those individuals that we hire, uh, the investment firms that come in, the legal experts that speak to us. I listen very carefully to them. I have many conversations with our executive director on these issues, trying to understand his viewpoint. And then I take it a little bit uh, more down to earth once I, I have that information. And I may I, I just look and, and, and ask myself, is what I'm about to do, the vote that I'm going to cast, going to be a positive impact for those individuals that elected me? the K-12 employees who are back in their buildings. And oftentimes we think of K-12 employees as teachers, but we're talking bus drivers, cafeteria workers, maintenance workers. We're talking a, a lot of different um, individuals uh, that those votes impact. So I asked that question. And then I go a little bit deeper than that. And I think about my three children who are in the classroom, all of whom are in their twenties. And will this vote impact them in a negative way as they get to retirement age? And then I'll back it down even further and I'll think about my daughter at Mississippi College and I'll ask the question, how is this going to impact kids that are sitting in universities now that are going to be our teachers next year or the year following? So I take it very personal in that regard and then I cast my vote accordingly. Um, so that's, that's kind of the way that I do it. Now, I may veer from that as I get more experience on the board, uh, but that's kind of the way that I've done it for the last two years. And, you know, um, what I hear from you is a commitment to your constituents. And, and I think that's very important. That's the reason that you're there. And for us, we have a similar commitment. We have a commitment to the retirees, the current state employees, um, and then also to taxpayers. And like we heard from Mayor Barker, um, who is also my constituent, um, they have concerns about the 2%. Would you walk me through the thought process that went into um, – voting to make that increase and, and where that, where cities and counties weighed in on that, uh, K-12 education and colleges and universities? Yes, there's obviously, I mentioned to you that reviewing the peer report has been of great benefit to me uh, because not only um, does it give you a lot of historical knowledge and, and actions of the board, and some of those peer review committees or peer review reports, they give you suggestions on what the legislature could do in the future to solve some of this, as well as what the board could do. Um, so one of those things, obviously, and, and through the recommendation of the actuaries, was a increase in the employer contribution rate. And if you recall, and the gentleman from Hattiesburg did mention this, at the initial vote was, I believe, 5%, and that was going to go into effect almost immediately, I believe, in October. Uh, of, of the year that we, we took that vote. I think that's maybe a year and a half ago. Not sure if that was about a year ago, Randy. And then obviously we've got, um, I won't say the board got pushed back, but maybe some of you guys got pushed back in that and because of the difficulty that that was going to face, well, the communities were going to face uh, because of that. So we compromised, if you will, or negotiated, and we backed that down uh, to 2% and phasing that in uh, as an attempt to try to help um, those those communities, those school districts absorb that a little bit um, over a long-term basis. So again, when the actuaries are sitting before you and the experts are giving you this advice and telling you that if you do not raise this rate, that your funding ratio is going to fall below 50% by the year 2034, that kind of ties the board's hands because the revenue's got to come from somewhere. We do have a, an issue, obviously, and it's, it's heavy on the benefit side. So as a new board member, the first thing I learned is, hey, the revenue's coming from somewhere. It's either, either coming today or down the road, but we've got to make tough decisions 
Um, and then that 2% was a tough decision. But again, my role and responsibility as a board member is to try to ensure that the funding is in place for the plan. My role as a superintendent and trying to find the $300,000 that that's going to cost us next year is a different entity in and of itself. That I don't sit there again as a superintendent. I sit there trying to make the best decision that, that I can make for those individuals who are receiving benefits and those individuals who will be, be receiving benefits in the future. We have to have a revenue stream. Yes, and, and I understand that. I think um, in this very room in a Senate finance hearing in 2022, uh, it was stated that um, in 25 years, so 2047 from that date, that PERS would be uh, funded at 83%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and so then it was not long after that, I think multiple things happened, but, but that changed the actuarial outlook. Um, so so at, right before that increase, we thought that things with PERS were very solid. Um, and, and then since then it has not been. And I think what a lot of people uh, in the Senate that I've spoken with um, want to know is instead of just looking for cash infusion from the state, which which I don't believe that the state is against doing a cash infusion, but I think the problem is a full commitment and perpetuity at, at every level of government for the employer share, right? Um, and, and the concern with that um, is that seems like one option that can be done, but what built the actuarial liabilities? Um, how are they increased to the point where we are 25 billion un unfunded um, and, and at a below 60% ratio? Is there other things that the board could consider besides just looking for a perpetuity cash infusion from the state? Absolutely, and as you know, Chairman, we did not get here overnight um, on the 25 billion unfunded liability. Um, that 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 took a while to get to get to this point. Uh, I do know that um, we did send over a legislative packet this year. Uh, part of that package uh, included um, discussion or implementation of the Tier Five. Um, obviously, if you look at the the background on the tier five, and that's even in one of the peer reports when uh, the peer review committee was looking at um, at a possible tier about seven or eight years ago. Uh, it does very little, if anything, uh, to fund uh, the liability in, in the get go. Uh, there were some other things I believe um, we did ask for a cash infusion, obviously, um, as well as the two percent. Uh, keeping in mind that um, our role is, is limited in terms of what we can do is limited by statute. Uh, so that, rec that, that vote on the 2% is about uh, the only tool in our toolbox that we can actually uh, implement um, ourselves without legislature, although you can certainly rescind that, we understand that. Uh, but when you get away from that, um, you know, we're making suggestions and, and options and, and trying our best to give le the legislature uh, some other avenues uh, and, um, Again, that legislative packet was sent to this um, this body as well as to the House, and uh, I believe that the the main thing with that that was um, again the tier five, and there was um, a piece there obviously that dealt with um, the dis distribution of uh, the cola check over twelve months. I don't think any either one of those have been taken up by uh, either body at this point, the tier five or the the um, the distribution of the cola. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions by other committee members? Senator Sparks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Smith. A couple of questions, and I'm if, if there's anything I ask you about that's kind of before you got on the board, since you're the newest person, you know, please tell me. I don't want to ask you something that you're not prepared or uh, have the experience for. But I understand you're currently a superintendent. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And you had mentioned three hundred thousand dollars. Had you already calculated that that's what it would cost your school district? We for, have. It's three hundred thousand dollars. Yes, sir. For that, for the two percent. It's yes. just just two percent. But that's now, correct. Did you vote for a two percent or five percent over three years? I voted for the five percent initially, and then when we um, negotiated, if you will, or compromised, and brought that back down to two percent, and they. Um, any manner in which would be phased in, I also voted for that. So 
5% is to be the increase in employer uh, portion within the next three years per the vote of the PERS board. Say that again, please. Well, you voted for 5%, but you voted to stagger it, correct? Correct, yes, okay. that's, that's correct. So 300,000 is just the 2%. That is correct. So 750,000 will be the number once it's at a full 5% just for your school district. That, that would be correct, okay. how, roughly, yes, sir. How do you intend to pay for that? Because I think that's a question I'm getting from some of my uh, school superintendents, universities, community colleges, on the back side of this, they've got to come up with it. So I'm just curious, you got 31 years, I hope you stay another 10 years <laughs> in the system, but uh, how, how are you going to come up with $750,000? Well, um, that's a difficult question to answer. Obviously, um, you look at every uh, avenue uh, of revenue that you have and, and determine where you may be able to shift funds uh, from one area to another, whether that be um, uh, reducing your, your maintenance budget, um, your administrative budget, uh, looking at personnel and, and absorbing um, your personnel costs when teachers leave instead of replacing them. Um, you, you, you eat your money that way, so to speak. Uh, so it, it would be difficult, but, but again, going back to um, the vote, as I mentioned earlier, um, at, at that time, you know, I'm not playing the role of superintendent, I'm playing the role of PERS board member. Uh, so I, I felt it was in the best interest of, of PERS to cast that vote uh, in the affirmative. And, and I think that's an excellent point that you voted as a PERS board member but you still operate as a superintendent and you've got to come up with $750,000. I think that brings home the point maybe that the mayor's making or the mayor from the small town I'm from, it's 5% no matter what your payroll is. And I think in part of your answer, it's, you know, you say we may have to cut personnel. Well, if we cut personnel, we're cutting salary. Absolutely. Okay. And as you know, all the data that's been given to us is we're, we're operating with a whole lot less PERS individuals now than we have uh, in a long time. So obviously that hurts uh, the plan as well. The, um, the, the couple of things, because we talk about this unfunded liability, and, and I, I won't go ahead if I may, Mr. Chairman, I cannot just, uh, um, my mother's a PERS retiree, okay, uh, 27 and a half years in the school system. And I personally believe the obligation she has met shall be fulfilled by this state. Uh, and that's true to every PERS recipient, beneficiary, retiree, and current employee. Uh, so, so I just want to be very clear. That's what I believe. Uh, but it is a math problem when, Absolutely. We, when we boil down to it. And uh, since I've only been here five years and in 2022, as the chairman referenced earlier, uh, we were told by the executive director with a lot of caveats, and by the way, all this is recorded. Uh, it actually, I can give you the date and time and everything, I'm going to watch it. But as a freshman senator, I was sitting here and we were told that in 2047, PERS would be 93.5% was actually the number because I went back and listened to it today, fully funded. I was a little taken aback by that because PERS was one of the biggest issues that I felt like the state faced. Now, to be very fair to the executive director, he said anything can happen. You know, things can happen. But I guess my question is, are you aware who were we relying on to give the information to the executive director to come tell this body, the Senate Finance Committee, that we'll be 97.5%, excuse me, 93.5% funded in 25 years. Is that from the actuaries? Do you know where that information came from? I would assume it's from the actuaries, but that would be a question for the executive director. I certainly cannot speak to that. Uh, what year did you, would you, did you indicate that that conversation was having? 2022, January 2022. 27. Um, yes, I would, I would make that assumption that that was coming from the actuaries. Okay. And, and so you had mentioned you take advice from these professionals and actuaries. Um, did you, or when you were there, did you vote on the reduction of the expected rate of return from 7.55 to 7%? I did. Okay. Can you tell me what was your reasoning behind that vote? 
Yes, if, uh, again, if you reflect back to my initial comments about how I go through the process of, of casting a vote, uh, one of those uh, um, things that I discussed and, and mentioned it a couple of times already was going back to the peer review. Those individuals who sit in this body and in the other body and take a look at PERS every year, if you will go back, and I'm not suggesting that you have it, I'm just saying as I went back, and, and looked at those, um, you will see evidence there to where uh, that rate was uh, being urged, if you will, to come down. And as I'm looking at that and I'm listening to those individuals before me uh, present the valuations and showing me the, the charts of, of, of the many different things that we look at, um, I felt that it was in the best interest of the plan to reduce that. Um, not just based on the fact that I had an expert in front of me telling me to do that or suggesting that I do that or the executive directors uh, suggesting that. I, I took a look at the peer review reports myself and if, if you go back um, and take a look at those, especially in, in 2017, you will see where those conversations have been held uh, quite a bit over the years. Are you aware that that decision by the PERS board inflated the unfunded liability by over $4 billion? Yes. You would agree? And yes. would you agree that the number was actually 775 in 2021 and that the reduction from, and I wanna make sure we're clear, I don't wanna get, you know, people get confused with math sometimes. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is, is the PERS board to a certain degree is establishing what they believe the gain, the rate of return on our assets, 31 plus billion, maybe 32 billion of PERS assets. And we lowered that from 7.75 to 7%, the PERS board did, which inflated the liability, which is 25.1 billion by $6 billion at least. So we added 6 billion to the balance sheet that drives the funded uh, ratio down, that's a paper transaction. I wanna be clear, we didn't lose $6 billion. We turned the knob from 775 expected rate of return to seven, but it did increase the unfunded liability by 6 billion, did it not? It, it did, and oftentimes, if we can get just a little simplistic for just a moment, when we tell individuals that we have a $25 billion unfunded liability, I think that, that some immediately think that that money has either been lost or it's been invested wrong. Right. And that, that's certainly not the case. To put it in plain terms, uh, if everybody retired today, we would be $25 billion short in paying our, our benefits to those individuals. So, uh, you know, the liability again is, is really, uh, those are those benefits that we owe people, as you mentioned, uh, regarding uh, your mother, we, we do owe her and we owe a whole lot of other folks. And, Again, getting back to it in just simplistic terms, we have to have a revenue source coming from somewhere. We cannot invest our way out of this problem. And you indicated um, that it was a math problem, and, and indeed it is. And um, you know, I, I dare to say that um, if the board changed tomorrow, the math is still the same. And the rules and regulations that the board has to follow um, are still the same. Um, even investments uh, are somewhat dictated to us through statute in terms of what we can and cannot do or what percentages and so forth. So um, I'm not disagreeing with anything you, you've said, obviously, um, but um, again, that, that's, that's my viewpoint. That's been my experience over the last two years. And I guess the, that decision by the PERS board to lower that in expected rate of return based on whatever you have taken into your decision process, experts, people with experience, are you aware that over the last 15 years, PERS investments have returned 9.78% rate of return? Yes, I am aware of that. So, and, and again, I cannot stress the fact enough that I believe this is a state obligation, no matter how the state has to handle it. But in the future, um, we have dialed the rate of return 2.78% lower than our past 15 years 
of actual returns, which has inflated the liability, which makes us fall below 60% funded, which is almost the red line. So I'm part of this, and I'm proud this is being reported, and I really appreciate the chairman doing this because I want to make sure that, that we all are on the same page, but the debt that's out there is a future liability to pay to our beneficiaries. And you touched on something that this board, this board can't lower anyone's uh, benefits, can they? No, sir. Even the language in this bill, whatever board there is, can't lower anyone's benefits, can they? That is correct. All right. I'm going to make sure we're clear on that. You are, you are correct. All right. And then I want to say something as it relates to your 31 years of service, because I had several calls from people who have 28 years, who have 29 years, who have 26 or 24 years, and they're concerned. Those people who are not yet retirees, their benefits are also locked by law, are they not? They are. Yet you don't have to run out and retire and take the lump sum because you're afraid. Because I've been getting those calls, and I'm as a PERS board member, I really appreciate that because if, if you really thought the system was in duress, with your 31 years, I assume you'd pack up and go home too. I would, and depending <laughs> on how the rest of this meeting goes, I might go home today. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see. Uh, Senator Parker. Mr. Chairman, for the record, we do have two other board members here. Yeah, you want to get one of them up. We may, we may just use well. all our questions on you. <laughs> So uh, this would be a valuable uh, lesson in who goes first yes, kind of sir. terminology. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually the first uh, first person up gets the, uh, the the greatest number of questions, but I just want to thank you uh, for, for being here, particularly on short no uh, notice. Uh, I want to thank you and the board for your service. I know, uh, you know, board like yours is not a, um, uh, it's, it, it's kind of like a sacrifice in church. It's like ushering. It's not something you're doing for what you're going to get out of it. It's hopefully something that you're doing for what you're going to give back. So I appreciate that. And thank you for that. Uh, also, there was a comment made earlier by another speaker uh, regarding the word sacrifice. I, I just want the people in the room to know that at least the members on this committee and, and the Senate as itself um, are not in a position at all to ask any of you to make sacrifices. I think you've already made the sacrifices that you did by working so hard in the teaching institution. And I know many of you are here today because you're concerned that uh, some of those sacrifices and time commitments you made in the past might be in jeopardy. And uh, the purpose of this, this, uh, this meeting today is put on by the chairman is to, uh, I think, make all of you feel better that that is not the case. Uh, but with that in mind, I do have a couple of questions here to, uh, to, to just kind of uh, try to get on here. And then some of this follows what Senator Sparks was mentioned just a moment ago. Uh, you made the um, statement a little earlier uh, that, um, that sometimes actuaries come to the meetings and uh, offer advice. Are the actuaries in each and every board meeting? As I reflect back, I would say they're, they're either in person or they're on the phone. Okay, so is it the same actuaries each time? Yes, I believe that's correct. Okay, so the actuaries from 2022 that Senator Sparks was mentioning to you are the same ones who told you in 2022 that everything was on a great track and are now telling you that, that things are, are certainly in a, in a different direction. Yes. So my, I guess my concern on that and my concern as I've listened to this is that uh, when, when I was a, a young child, somebody told me, um, you know, don't take financial advice from somebody who has less money than you. And so my concern in that situation is that if the actuaries are not providing the board with the information that they need that you can trust and that you can rely upon to make the decisions, um, do you feel there's any additional help that we could give you as a body to have some more expertise or some other people in the room or other participants, you know, in your decision making that can bring valuable insight and uh, information to your uh, decision making. Well, certainly, as a new board member, uh, I would certainly welcome any uh, 
any advice, any expertise that, that you could offer me as well as the other board members. Uh, that's probably a better question for someone that's that's been on the board for a while that has maybe seen um, different actuaries come before the board. Uh, having been there two years, uh, this is the only one that I've seen. So uh, to answer your question in short, um, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what, what experts that, that you could provide for us or what information you could provide for us. I would just tell you that um, uh, the board would always welcome that. And you mentioned well, this board member would, I, I'll speak for myself. You, you mentioned one in your statement there. So is it usually one actuary who's on the phone or who's conferencing in during the board meetings or is it a team or? Well, it's usually a team. We have access to that. And, and as well as, um, um, anytime after the meeting, I'll, I may ask the exec director questions that he will run through, uh, the actuary and, and get back with me. Um, I actually asked one yesterday regarding the 2% and when that would fall. If we did not implement that, when would it, um, our funding ratio fall below 50%? And, and of course that's in 2034. So um, I wanted to be prepared for that in case um, that was brought up because again, um, I, I know there's some, there's some heartache out there obviously about the 2%, but again, that is the, the board's uh, really so recourse, if you will, and to generating dollars. Right, and, you, and Senator Sparks mentioned this earlier, uh, the, the move down from the 7.75 to 7% over time, um, as, as soon as today in some of our discussions we had, has actually had an effect on the bond rating for the state. Um, have the actuaries ever mentioned to you in any of the conversations or meetings that the movement of that number um, might have an effect on the bond rating of the state as far as the decision makings that are occurring in the board? I don't recall any direct conversations regarding that, but I will say the uh, state treasurer has mentioned that uh, multiple times in the meeting regarding um, how it may affect our bond rating. So I just, just as a member of this committee, I, I would appreciate if the board would, you know, take a serious look, you know, at that move that was made on that, um, you know, a, a move back on, on that number, I think could, uh, you know, help some of the outlook and, you know, and, and the other thing I'll kind of just mention, because last night I looked at, you know, some stock performance that, that I've seen over this last year, because this has been, as most of the people in this room will probably attest, it's been a pretty favorable stock year, you know, and so um, I would say that 7% would be a, a vastly low percent, I hope, that's going to be a low number for what PERS actually performs this year because there, there are some funds out there that are up, you know, in the 25, 30 percent, you know, as far as performance for uh, for this year. But do you, as you make recommendations or reports to, um, to PEER or any of the reporting agencies that you have to make reports, do you have a, an ability to make adjustments um, outside of the annual reporting that you do? Or does every report just kind of lie on okay, we finish our fiscal year on this date, and that's the, uh, the date in stone where we make our provisions and decisions. You mentioned, uh, Senator, making reports. As an individual board member, I, I do not make any reports to uh, the peer committee. Uh, that would be the job for the executive director and his staff. Uh, so that's, that's about the only answer I can give you on that, um, if I understood your question. So, so you, there's no look at, like, at this point, uh, what you project or what you think that the percentage yield might be on uh, the money you have in the bank for this year. I mean, do you think 7% is a fair estimate of what you're actually going to achieve for this year? Or do you think that, per my example, that it should be a, a much stronger year than a 7% year as far as return? Well, uh, going back to your comment, I, I certainly hope it's more than 7%, obviously. Um, as, as you know, any time that... Um, uh, again, keeping in mind, we're talking about a $33 billion fund, obviously. Um, so uh, not every bit of that, obviously, is, is invested uh, in the stock market, per se. Uh, so again, going back to the 7%, I think if you look back historically, that recommendation has been made by the peer review committee, if I'm not mistaken, to, to begin to lower that um, and in fact, I, I believe that it was lowered at one point um, a year or two ago. Um, and it wasn't lowered at the uh, at the rate uh, the actuary was actually advising on, if I'm not mistaken about that. Am I correct, Executive Director, on that? Right. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to 
we can we can follow up with that. Okay. Okay. We can follow up with you on that later. So yeah, I, I guess we'll we'll get that information later. But you know, just kind of in summary here, what I what I think I'm hearing, uh, again, I opened up with a thank you to the board members. Um, uh, I'm very happy that you, the eight of you, take the time to sacrifice and do the work that you do. And again, I greatly appreciate that. Um, what I would hope we get out of this meeting is an ability to help you because I do think we're possibly seeing some um, avenues or ways that financially, you know, we could help uh, bring expertise or more experience uh, as far as actuaries to the table for you. Um, would you be welcome or would you be um, willing to hear any input from additional people as far as that matter would go? Absolutely. And then again, as, as the new board member, uh, I'm more than willing to come back as often as you invite me. And, and hopefully uh, as the years go by, um, um, you'll be impressed with the knowledge that, um, that I've gained over the years working with the board. Uh, but um, I think your questions today have been fair and um, I hope I've answered them uh, as best I can. You, you've done fantastic. And, and in two years, uh, you've, uh, you've, You've learned a lot. You know, you've answered the questions. And, uh, and again, I thank you for your service. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, I think you have one more before you can sit down. Uh, Senator Norwood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, too, uh, Mr. Neal, thank you for, for your service. And uh, but I have a few questions I want to ask you. Uh, how long you say you've been superintendent? Eight years. Eight years now, and you said that you're uh, you're looking at a payout of about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars over some time. Over um, yes, sir. If you looked at the five percent increase, that, that, that's about right. Now, how long do you think it, it took you to get to that point, Senator? To ask your question again, I'm not sure I quite understood you. How long do you think the it would, it would have taken to accumulate that much of, um, of uh, up to $750,000. If I'm understanding you correctly, uh, the question is, um, with the 2%, uh, the school no, district... I guess what I'm saying is, not. I'm just foregoing the 2 and the 5%, but I'm saying the entire $750,000, how long do you think it took your district to get to that point. In terms of the 5% increase were to go into effect, we would be, um, that would cost us about $750,000, correct? Right. That, that, that's, that, that's roughly correct. Then the school district would have to, through its budget, figure out a way to balance its budget, knowing that it has $750,000 less to spend because that 750 is now going towards the contribution rate uh, that we now must pay uh, as the employer. What type of impact do you think that'll have on your district? Well, the 750 would be very difficult, obviously. Uh, again, about the only way, to be honest, that a school district can come up with that kind of money um, is either an increase in the budget um, through the legislature or uh, looking at um, at teachers in terms of not replacing those teachers who leave, uh, which uh, creates other problems for us as well. So anytime you're talking about that amount of money in a school district, especially one my size, uh, you might you might almost always have to look at personnel. Okay, and uh, you know, my wife is a retired school teacher and I'm a former state employee. And I think one of the things that attracted me to the, uh, to the state, and I encourage my children to do the same, were the benefits that were um, that were paid. Do you think um, if you cutting teachers is not going to be uh, a solution? Uh, what do you think if you uh, and you can't cut the benefits because that's going to make it less attractive for you? Even anybody who considered the profession, am I correct? Yes, sir. Now, you also mentioned the COLA payment. Uh, what type of impact would that have? Not that I'm advocating for that now. Uh, you said spread it over a 12 month period. 
Well, yes, sir. I believe the recommendation uh, from the board was, um, if I could just kind of walk through it just very briefly, uh, current retirees um, who are retired now, uh, the vast majority of them get their COLA check in December. Uh, some have chosen uh, to spread that out over 12 months. So the recommendation uh, from the board was that we just uh, default that in, in the legislation to where um, any future retiree, uh, their COLA would be spread out over 12 months. However, uh, that retiree would have an option uh, to get it at December. So it is my understanding that by doing that, uh, and spreading it out over 13 months helps um, us with our cash flow, especially around the month of December and January, where we're also paying uh, benefits on top of the COLA check. Would it have a, would it have a negative impact on interest that you would accrue on those? Uh... Well, part part of that, Senator, I believe is it deals more with um, the timing of the selling of of asset selling of stocks to generate the dollars that it takes uh, to pay that 13 check. And sometimes that's difficult doing that all in the month of November and December leading up to the, to the distribution. So I think it would be just a less burden on the system as a whole um, if that was distributed over 12 months. Keeping in mind that um, none of this impacts their benefits. Their checks don't go down, it's just a matter of dividing it out in 12 monthly installments versus getting it all at December. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Thank you, Senator Norwood. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you taking the time to meet with us again, especially on such short notice. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Hannah, uh, if you would join us. Um, and, and look, we appreciate three bill. We, we couldn't go through eight, um, obviously, but but we thought that three um, would be a great uh, way to try to get a different feel for for different perspectives on the board. So, um, uh, you, you, I don't know what questions you may be asked, but if you don't mind leading off with a few things about yourself and and how long you've been on the board, what you do. Yes, my name is Kim Hanna, and I happen to be uh, the chairperson for this distinguished group of board members that we currently have. Um, I would like to thank you for a little bit of pause just to give us an opportunity to speak and thank you for the invitation. Um, my name is, again, is Kim Hanna. I'm the municipal representative um, for the PERS board. I was elected by the municipal employees. Um, 2024 marks my 30th year um, with the city of Tupelo. I'm their city clerk and their CFO. Um, I do know, similar to Jay, how it feels to take some of the decisions back home, um, but that doesn't deter my decisions. We have a sworn duty, uh, we all do. We have a sworn duty as fiduciaries to make the best decision for the plan, for the members, for all the members. We represent everyone here uh, by representing the plan. Um, just similar to Jay, it, we try to attend every meeting. We do attend every meeting. Um, we review the material that we're giving, uh, given before committee. Committee is a very important aspect. We're all invited to attend all the committee meetings, whether we're on that committee or not. We have the opportunity to vote, to listen, and we all attend most committee meetings um, meetings just because we want to have that information. We want to make a good informed decision. Um, and uh, much like Jay, I look to the staff. I look to the, uh, the tenured board members, the more seasoned. They're not older than me, but they're certainly mature in their status on the board. Uh, but I certainly appreciate having those tenured board members to go to. I ask a lot of questions out of committee um, about the material that I get, and I'm very passionate about PERS. I'm a third generation um, uh, PERS member. Uh, it's very important to me, and it was a draw to the system, to the, the, the path that I chose um, in, you know, in my career. Uh, but at the same time, I have to take that city clerk, that CFO hat off when, I, when I'm at the PERS board, per board meetings and make those difficult decisions sometimes. 
Uh, thank you. Um, if, if we can pick up a little bit where we just left off. Um, so when we talk about cash flow and, and managing cash flow by selling some assets and the timing of that, is that something that the money managers do for you? Um, that is, well, that our needs for our liabilities have a direct impact on everything, including the asset allocation that's even recommended. Um, so the liquidity of everything is handled by the staff. We have got um, both accounting and investment professionals, two different divisions that both oversee that and make informed decisions. They know how much it's going to be, especially in December when we're writing um, $850 million in 13th checks. Uh, they know exactly what they need, um, and, and they bring that to us. So that's an internal administration function. Is that what you're saying? Yes. As far as I'm aware, that's who reports to us, and that is an internal function of what, what they do, what the staff of PERS does. Okay. And, and I assume they work closely with the money managers on that, though. Um, ab absolutely. They work with Callan, who oversee the money managers, as well as um, the accounting staff. Okay. Good deal. And, and the actual, so the money managers manage the assets. The actuaries calculate the estimated liabilities. And that's their focus. Is that accurate? Yes. Based on actuarial standards. They bring that to us. They're adjusted for time from time to time. About I think every two years, we we look at demographic assumptions that don't change it a whole lot. We look at economic assumptions that tend to change it more, such as the assumed rate of return. Um, so we're constantly looking at industry standards and following the advice of of our professionals, sometimes that leads to an unattractive picture. Even though it's just the swipe of a pen, it, based on industry standard, that is a more true and accurate picture. Yes. And, and you mentioned the um, fiduciary responsibility of serving on the board to retirees and people in the purse system. Um, and that holds true for anybody that serves on that board, regardless of their background. Is that true? That is correct. Even our executive director has fiduciary responsibilities. Even our professionals, such as Callan or such as Kevin All McDonald, they've got fiduciary responsibilities as well. Regardless of a person's background or um, how they are on the board, uh, they have the same fiduciary responsibility to retirees. That is correct. Okay. And, and then, uh, you know, in this committee, uh, there's seven members, uh, us across here. We, um, I think that we have a fantastic committee from all different backgrounds, different political parties, and, and everyone up here has a lot to offer at, with any topic that we choose to cover. Um, on your board, you have 10 members, eight of which um, have essentially the same constituency. And, and I haven't looked, but I would venture that eight people on the board vote together virtually 100% of the time. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, would it be helpful to you if there were three to five additional members from what you have now that bring a different perspective um, that can help, um, help look for options that can both protect retirees and be cognizant of the effects in other areas of state government. Would that be helpful to you if we could do that? Um, I'm always open to additional information, whether it's sitting as an ex officio type position that doesn't necessarily vote or that just might bring insight or whether it is a voting member. I'm always open to that. Um, I would be, I've been on the board um, gosh, five years since 2018, but late 2018. Um, and I'm constantly learning things. There's things that don't really come around except maybe once every five years, or, um, we've got our routine things such as an election coming up for one of the, um, for one of the board members or various things that are constantly, um, before us. But there's some important things that just don't come around that often. Um, I 
I would see that um, any additional information is always helpful. I, I would not, I would not um, be opposed to that at all. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and, and I wanna let you know, um, I, you mentioned how grateful you were that you're here today. We also appreciate this. Um, you know, we want, again, to reiterate, um, to be transparent, to, to understand what the needs are and, and in what ways we can help because um, our constituents are everybody out here and, and we care about retirees, current employees, uh, their benefits. And, and then we also care about our cities and counties and our children at school. And, and so we have a large constituency. And so we also care and, and greatly appreciate you being here and want you to know that um, I heard from lots of members and my number is out there and I'd love to hear from you as well sometime. Okay. Uh, any other questions for other members? Uh, Senator Smart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Ms. Hannah. The, the fiduciary uh, conversation that you have, I assume y'all probably take an oath when you get elected. We do. Okay. Um, and I understand that you've referenced staff several times and the executive director, and I want to be fair. And, and again, because this is being recorded and I want people to help understand the process. The whole point of this is that we all get in the room together and talk, which I think is good. Um, but for everyone that doesn't know, the executive director, uh, presents to us every year. So that that's one of the reasons we wanted to talk to, uh, purse board members. Plus, uh, the executive director is not elected by the people. They, he is appointed by the board. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And um, the, the actuaries, and, and I know there's different terminologies for people because there's investment staff, there's actuaries. Um, all of them, I'm assuming, uh, do that at some cost. It's a job, correct? That's their professional job. Right. Of course, the staff draw a salary, but yet we do... Um, request proposals from time to time for uh, for the professionals that will will draw based on a contract amount that is correct okay and and that you, you, all, you almost answered my next question so that's how good you're doing <laughs> uh, is that the investment team that invests the assets that belong to PERS belong to the beneficiaries um, are are they bid out and if so could you Tell us kind of how that goes, because I know people you throw around RFP, RFQ, uh, lowest and best. It, it, how does the board, if you know, if you've done it within that five years, if you haven't, I'll save it for somebody else. But how do y'all determine who PERS hires to uh, manage the money for PERS? Well, that's typically done by the investment staff. Now, it is an RFP for uh, Callan. Those are our investment advisor. That is, um, they typically, we look at around um, three or four of propos uh, proposals that we uh, advertise for. We get those in. We look at them. Typically, they're all good. Typically, they rank way up there. But to manage $32 billion, $33 billion, the last we, we uh, looked, but $33 billion in assets, you, and a lot of them, a lot of the managers don't deal with government. So the ones that do deal with that size and um, typically, typically we look at everyone, they're typically pretty good um, as we review, but um, we've been with Callan for a while now since I've been on the board um, and, but they are our advisors and they help with the selection of the money managers. Okay, and I want to, and again, if, if, if I can understand it, maybe everybody else can too, but I want to make sure that I didn't get confused there. Who is Callan? Are they the actuaries or no, they are advisors? They're, the, they're our investment company that advises. All right, do they do the investment work? Well, they do a lot of the professional work and I, I certainly will get Ray who does, I, I'm, I, again, I, I'm not, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, no. but the executive director is, is not on the schedule. 
I don't mind clearing it up. I, I really don't know, and I promise I don't know, but you, you're describing Callan has a role. All right, who is the uh, actuary? The actuary, I'm sorry, the sorry. actuary is Kavanaugh McDonald. All right, so they, they are the ones in an actuary standpoint they they kind of do all the calculations and come back and give y'all guidance about if you turn this knob this way this happens etc is that is that a fair assumption that is correct right. there there we look at our unfunded liability as an actuarial unfunded how much we anticipate when people are going to retire and how long they're going to live everything from all uh, the economic assumptions and what even the investment team, uh, the staff, you know, what we're going to accomplish over that period. Do we have part of the staff being employees at PERS that are part of the investment decisions? And then in addition to that, we have this outside, what did you call them, Callan? Or who, who the investment team like i don't know do you do we hire one team or do we hire a bunch of people that in, invest in different fields we have investment staff okay. and they do most of the decision making but we have callan who oversees and assists with the, al the target asset allocation as well as um as well as the money managers and making those selections they're when we have an investment committee meeting, Callan is there and they're often with Charles, our main staff member, um, as our investment uh, person. He, they all ask questions, they all collaborate, they all have good oversight over our money managers and watch these funds, make recommendations when they should go on the watch list, if they're underperforming or if there's a pause because of the economy um, in terms of a certain area, there there are times when uh, they will appear on a watch list, and that is brought to us as oversight as well. Uh, but they're constantly, that's what they do. They're constantly reviewing what these money managers are doing. So who pays the money managers? Because what I'm hearing is we have an investment advisement team that if one of the money managers is not performing up to standard that would get reported to the board because it's very important but who are the money managers how do they get paid is that like a, a lot of diverse group of people that are chosen by the investment team well we get that reported to us in terms of gross and net so we do see the cost but exactly how that is transacted i'm not exactly sure okay okay thank you um what do you said you are in a municipal government? What, what where are you? I was just curious. Municipality. What municipality do you work with? City of Tupelo. Oh, okay. All right. I, I thought you looked from here. So uh, I'm up in northeast Mississippi as well. Uh, the increase um, two percent as far as cities, uh, and, and we kind of went through this a little earlier. It's my understanding that would be about thirty five million for municipalities. Do you have? Any idea, and if you don't, it's okay, but do you have any idea what that 5% impact is on the city of Tupelo? Absolutely, it's $1 million. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator McCon, did you have a question? Any other questions? About Ms. Hanna, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McCoy, if you don't mind joining us, uh, another Lee County native. I think uh, I think three of eight elected uh, board members are from Lee County, if I'm not mistaken. Y'all, that again? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot you said that you needed us to speak a little bit louder. I believe three out of eight elected board members are from Lee County. Uh, that's correct. Uh, little yeah. overrepresented, overrepresented from the South Mississippi perspective, but. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming down here today. Um, my name is Randy McCoy, and I am from Tupelo, Mississippi. I am elected representative of the retirees. Uh, I run in a statewide election. There's a, over 118,000 people that are eligible to vote for the retiree representative. Uh, once I am elected and I take the oath of office, 
my constituency is no longer 118,000, but it's approximately 360,000 individuals who receive retirement benefits. It, it changes. I did grow up in Tupelo, went through Tupelo Public Schools, um, went to Bellhaven College a year, Etiwama Community College a year, graduated from Mississippi State University with a degree in accounting. Then uh, I wanted to teach and coach, so I got a certificate to be able to teach. I taught all kinds of business education courses, accounting, uh, taught the first computer class at Tupelo High School, taught typewriting, economics, all of that sort of thing. Decided to go into a school administration, got my master's degree from Ole Miss. I decided I really liked the administration part of it. So I decided to continue my education and I finished my doctorate at George Peabody College of Vanderbilt University. The interesting thing about that program was it was almost split in half in that we were taught about how to manage a school district curriculum and instruction wise and human resource side. And then we had major professors in business to teach us about the business side of it, bonds, uh, all of that sort of thing that a superintendent uh, has to deal. Uh, so then why am I on the board and why was I interested in running? I was a superintendent of schools more than half of my career. Uh, in Mississippi, I was superintendent in Brookhaven. I was superintendent in Clinton. Uh, left the state for four years in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and then came back to Tupelo. I was there for seven years, and then after I retired, I was a, uh, I did a year's worth of interim work in Meridian while they were looking for a superintendent. In that time, I was steadily recruiting individuals to come into education. And one of the selling points was, you need to stay in Mississippi, we don't pay as much as Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee, or Arkansas, but we have a, a retirement system that is worth teaching the children of Mississippi and you'll be taken care of. I felt it was still my responsibility because I had recruited on that and I had uh, promised that, that I should try to help maintain it. And I ran for it after Dr. Virgil Ballou retired. Uh, and I replaced him twice. He was superintendent in Clinton. I replaced him there and then he retired on the board and I replaced him here. So that's how I got to the position uh, in which I work today. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to talk with you. I, I think, how long have you been on the board? I'm in my second six year term. Um, I'm actually in my 12th year. I believe I, I'm due to run again uh, next summer. Good luck. Um, we, we all just finished an election cycle and happy to be past it. Um, <laughs> we, yes, we, we would like the six year term though. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit more on the information that y'all get to, to make decisions off of. Um, Callan, as I understand it, manages money. Um, uh, you don't have to make as many decisions about that. A lot of that is legislative, I think, on what um, what we even allow for investments to be made. Is that correct? I remember a bill a couple of years ago where we expanded the ability to invest in certain things, say private equity for one. We have to follow the state law on yes. all of that. Now, Callan, as our consultant on all of our assets and our distribution of assets and our asset allocations, uh, what they do is to give us advice and uh, to help us uh, make sure that we're able to maximize the investments in good times and that we will suffer fewer losses in the bad times by that asset allo uh, allocation and the weight of stocks, bonds, real estate, all of the things that PERS is able to, uh, in which we're able to invest. Yes, okay. And then Kevin on McDonald, on the actuarial side, uh, they make recommendations based on um, being as conservative as possible with the estimated liabilities. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. In fact, uh, they're conservative to a 
fault, in my opinion. But that, us too, we feel that. Neither here nor there. That's some of the spirited discussion that the board has periodically. Yes. Yes. And and then it's y'all's role to discern between the investments that you're in and the recommendations on the estimated liability to to decide what the best course of action is to take. Is that accurate? You're going to have to repeat that for me. I apologize. Um, you all take the information from the uh, from Kavanaugh McDonald on what they recommend as the conservative approach to estimated liabilities. And then you look at the investments that you're in and what the market is yielding. And it's pretty clear usually what your contributions from the employee and employer side are going to be. And, and then you all make decisions based on that information. Is that right? Yeah. I, let me help the way, this is the way I interpret it. Callan comes to us and they will, um, ever so many years, they will make a market prediction of where things are going, what the general tenor of the market will be. They make a prediction that's based on 10 years of prediction. Okay. Then the actuary comes in, takes that information along with all of the other data that they need to uh, do to come up with the liabilities. For instance, there are 17 different assumptions that the actuaries have to use in order to do it. And in fact, our board controls very few of those. We don't control the mortality table. We don't control the world economic condition. We don't control wars and rumors of wars that disrupt supply chains. We, we don't uh, control the rate of retirement. Uh, we, we don't control uh, uh, how many active members that we actually have. You know, as a matter of fact, since 2013 to 2023, we have, for whatever reason, reduced 13,000 paying people that would be part of PERS. Now, whether that's because of efficiency motives or whether it's reduction in force, uh, whether it's outsourcing, the, un the unintended consequences of that is a direct impact to PERS. Now, I use some just, I'm gonna call it Lawhorn Elementary School arithmetic. I don't do the fancy computations that the, the actuary does. But if you were to take 15,000 employees, and if you were to just divide those in, in, in the active numbers and how much we got in revenue from our current actives, and then you multiply that times 15,000, if we'd had that contribution plus the employer's contribution, and, and say that we got the same percentage return in 2023 with an additional 15,000 employees, that would come up with, in my arithmetic, and it may be absolutely wrong because it's just pure arithmetic, probably be close to uh, $500 million. And then if you take all of our expenses and subtract it from it for the same number doing using arithmetic, what that also would, would tell me is that we would have about $140, $140 million above our expenses. So just the mere fact of, of reduction of employees over the last 20 years has exacerbated our problem. And that's through no fault of anybody. And, and when you say 140 million over your expenses, are you saying that the employer contribution plus employee contribution alone minus the benefits being paid? Um, and including the investment returns. Okay. Revenue as well. But now this past year, I believe we had close to 800 million above our expenses, didn't we? You know, I can't remember precisely what that number uh, is, but the way I did that was I took the 7.55% uh, uh, and we got like 7.7 .7 or 7.8 and I took that 2% yes. and multiplied it times the total revenue and whatever and I came up with that 100 But then when we talk, so I think our cash flow, at least for this past year, was positive. Um, and, and I believe it is for most years, unless we have a down investment year. Um, 
but if we also had 13,000 more employees, um, would that not increase the potential liabilities or the estimated liabilities for future retirees? Uh, it, it, certain, it certainly would, but that's the reason I try to do it to get the total amount of expenses because I use the, I use the uh, uh, last year's $20 billion and tried to include that in the expenses. Of the okay. Year. But yeah, absolutely, yes, and it probably would. And, and to that point, the actuarial assumptions, I think you had mentioned earlier about, well, one year the actuary's number said this, and the very next year it says something different. That's because some of those actuarial assumptions changed, and if they change, that's going to change the numbers, and, and yeah. you or I have any control over those. Yes, and some of those are in the billions of dollars, aren't they? I'm sorry? And some of those have billions of dollars worth of effect and estimated liabilities. Could be. Um, when, we, when we look at cash flow, the, the two things that we're looking at with PERS, if I'm not mistaken, are cash flow in a given year and unfunded liabilities as a percent, or I guess how much assets funded we are. Is that accurate? Those are the two primary things we need to know about PERS most years? The thing that I look at yes. is cash flow. Okay. Cash flow is what determines can we pay or can we not pay our bills. Yes. Uh, the unfunded liability for a mature, a mature retirement system, there will always be some of that. The projection that the actuaries used when we reduced from 7.55 down to 7, with those numbers and what we had sent over to the legislature, the actuarial numbers uh, tell us that the cash flow, which is right now a negative number, and it will always be a negative number in a mature retirement system, that it will grow. It will go from like a negative three, what it is now, into two, uh, 2033 up to about a negative five. And then at that point, it will start decreasing all the way to 2053, where it'll be a negative 2%. That, that, that curve, cash flow gets worse and worse for about 10 years, and then it starts to change. And, and on that cash flow, would you help me understand the, the data points that go into that? Because, for instance, if I look at, for this past year, the investment revenue that we made on our assets, and we add in the employer contribution and the employee contribution, and then we subtract out the benefits paid, and we subtract out the $100 million for the money managers and the $17 million roughly for the administration, uh, we cash flowed positive roughly seven hundred and ninety one million dollars. Okay. I mean, I don't I didn't catch all the numbers in what you were saying there, but yeah, we would take all of our expenses uh, versus our revenue. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. Thank you. Any other questions by committee members? Uh, Senator Sparks? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCoy. and and uh, just a piggyback on that just a minute because I want to make sure when you know we have testimony that says we're negative cash flow makes people nervous um, I've had we always refer to them as little old ladies they're people that taught me uh, who have called me and reached out to me this week scared to death their checks are going to stop we have 33 billion dollars under assets their checks ain't about to stop so so I, I just want to make sure when we say it's negative cash flow we're in the weeds on inside the numbers numbers but we have 30 is it 33 i think somebody said earlier 33 billion under management right now we do that's, okay that's our current asset all right yes. th thank you and then uh we have the nine percent the employee pays the 17.4 that the employer pays those are contributions yes and all you got to do is take gross payroll of the state multiply it times those numbers and you know which contribution is Fixed number, correct? Yes, that's what I would do with arithmetic. Yes, yeah, that we I think we went to the same school of math. Uh, then 
the outflow, you got a pretty good idea on that, but it's a guesstimate because people pass away. People retire out of normal cycle. There's things that happen that someone becomes disabled and there's a different type of retirement, though they didn't hit 25 or 30 years. So I get that that number is a little uncertain, but then your growth number, which is your investment income. Yeah. If you take your contributions plus your investment income, and you subtract out what you pay to beneficiaries and the cost of your plan. We are in the black last year, $791 million, I think was the number the chairman used. But yeah. is, okay, okay. So, yeah. so that's a positive cash position. Yes, it is. Uh, okay, all right, good. And that's and, a good and, thing. And, <laughs> and, and, and technically, that is paid toward our liability because it increases our assets. Perfect. That's exact. Okay. Thank you. Because... What we had happen in 2022 when this thing got off the rails, and I'm proud you talked about a mature plan because an immature plan is a plan we just started and everybody's paying in, nobody's taking out. You're, you're well funded. But as people move into the system, uh, if your size of government grows or shrinks as far as pens or payroll, uh, those things come into play. But as we move through the unfunded liabilities, how we use our gains affects that. And I wanna make sure that, that I'm understanding this correctly because it's what I understand. We ran an 8% expected rate of return on this plan for years. Is that, is that fair? That 8% was our expected rate of return for many years on yeah, this plan. And, and then the PERS board, elected maybe around 15 or so to reduce that to 775 that's correct that inflated our liabilities by about 2 billion because yeah. we changed the expectations doesn't mean we were losing money we changed the expectations is that correct uh, that's correct and okay. if i could interrupt yes. you that's the reason i look at cash flow more than wow. i look at those other things because the manipulation yes. of the expected return has a direct impact on the liability, but it's the cash flow yes. to me that's the more critical thing. Thank you. We went to the same school of math. I guarantee you we did okay. because, because now what that leads to is that when we had a 31 plus percent return on investment in 2021-ish before the presentation was made here in 2022, that was a tremendous growth in assets but we did not pay down the unfunded liability with that full gain, did we? We bought the no, rate down no. two tenths of a point. What, what, what we did with yes. that was the PERS funding policy mm -hmm. says for us to try to get to 7%, we would take that and we would apply that to that thing. Yes. And what that did was lowered us to the 755. Yeah, yeah. So which, which is a PERS decision, yeah. but it did not pay our unfunded liability down as much as the earnings we created. Uh, that is, in my mind, I follow exactly yes. what you're saying, but uh, not a but. It's uh, and with that, uh, it 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 did not affect the uh, cash flow. That's right. Yes. It did not have, yes. And the cash flow, I keep coming yes. back to the cash flow because that's the important thing uh, to me in that situation. Now, if I might, to, to talk a little bit about this moving of the projected rate of return, if you will think about in 1999. If, when, if you, I'm sorry, will you please just make sure that people are hearing you? This is good okay. stuff. I don't want this to get past in, anybody. In 1999, when the new set of benefits came out where the 3% and the 3% compounded started occurring. Yes, sir. When that happened, we were blowing and going. There was lots of good returns. At that time, the economy was really driven by the United States. Since that time, the whole world has become involved in the economy. What has happened is if you can imagine a bell curve, and this is the way I think of it, is the bell curve, we were up here in the upper quartile. The rest of the world started joining the economy. And as they did, and they started uh, all of their stuff, it started pulling our numbers 
toward the middle. It regresses toward the mean. And as it regresses toward the mean, then that becomes what uh, Callan, because they're looking at worldwide stocks and costs and values, and that's what the actuary through their standards begin to look at. Well, what is the worldwide return going to be? Now, when we moved it, now I'll go ahead and admit to this group, I voted against the 7%. I voted against that. And the reason I voted against it because I didn't want to come the full 5.5%. I wanted to do it in slower increments simply because I knew that it was going to have that effect on our cash, uh, I mean, on our unfunded liability. But now, uh, I need to go ahead and say this. My goal was still to get to 7% because I know the worldwide mean of returns on stocks was in the middle. So I wanted to get there. I just didn't want to go as fast. And if you look, I voted against it, and it was particularly because of that reason. There's nothing wrong with the 7%. I just objected to how we wanted to get there. And, and we, y'all, it's not, we do have spirited discussions, okay, about some of this as it, as it goes on. But this board is a smart board. They're intellectually sharp. They understand what's going on. And by, I think it was your comments over the last 15 years, yes. this, this, this board has outperformed 98% of all other pension funds in our class. And, and if we have done that, this, this board is doing a good job. What we got is a numbers problem. Did that weigh on your decision not to go to seven so quickly because we were running a nine plus percent return for the past 15 years? That although there may be a lag with the you know, world economy catching up to us, it was a shock to the system now, to turn me, the dial okay. 7.75 in three years, because that's about how long it took us to get 7.75 to seven. That's a $6 billion increase to the unfunded liabilities. Well, I, I can't address that precisely, but what I can say is that doing it as quickly as we did, just ripping the Band-Aid off and going to where it needed to be, I thought it would be too big of a shock to the system. And I did not want to do that. The, the, the board itself voted to do that. I support what the board did because we got there. But now, uh, it, 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 the shock has sent ripples and yes. consternation that I don't think needs to be there. Did that move cause us to drop below 60%? Sir? Did that move from 755 to 7 cause the plan to drop below 60% funded? Yes. Okay, that's, and that was a yes. That's the most important thing because 60% is kind of a red line. Is that not, is that correct? 60% funded is kind of a red line in the pension world and the mature pension plan? Uh, it's a line I, I, I don't know of demarcation. I don't know that it's a, a, a red line, but I know that our system has been able to pay everything that's been due retirees, and we have been at that 60% level since 2010 and 2011. level. Uh, uh, I mean, from 2010 and 11 to, to today. I personally uh, think that uh, that... 60% is not a bad place to be, but we've got to now match that with where the world is going on returns, and we've got to match that with the liability. If the liability continues to increase and doesn't turn, that will create, in my mind, a problem. Now, let me share this point with you. And again, this is... Y'all, I am not speaking for the board. I am not. I am speaking as Randy McCoy, just a person that went to all the board meetings. Okay, what in my mind? I mentioned the mortality table a few minutes ago. The a big part of that more. Well, let me put it like this: I did some more of that arithmetic of that twenty-five billion dollars. About eight billion of that, I believe, belongs to current retirees. The rest of it belongs to people that are currently working or inactive. 
the mortality table, bless our hearts for us, all of us baby boomers, in about 2033, we're going to start dying on in significant numbers. When that happens, and that's in the year about 23 to 26, that's when the negative cash flow starts to turn. That liability will disappear as we pass away. I, I hope that's no I, time I, soon. Well, <laughs> it, oh, let me, well, let me tell y'all, right now there's about 100, 100 people that are still drawing money from PERS that are over 100, and I want to be in that bunch, okay? Yeah, that, you, you can describe to that, too. But what happens is, in my mind, we have a long-term goal. It took us over 20 years to get there. We, it's going to take us more than 20 years to get out. But we, you all, the legislature has made it very clear. We don't want to touch any of the benefits of retirees and the people. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's what you have, have said. Well, when we sent over our legislative program under the actuary numbers, if in the bill that kind of brought us here uh, rescinded that 2%, if all of the actuary assumption stays the same, in the year 2053, instead of 56.1, it'll be 75% funded. And you will see on the charts that you may have had and got from our actuaries, even on that chart, it will get worse for the next few years. And then when we get to 2033, but we have to hang on. We have to hang on and then it should begin to resolve itself, unfortunately, through some natural attrition. And what we also have is the estimates, uh, and, and it's on a sheet that I think that you probably have, and it looks similar to, let me see if I can find it here, hold it up. It's a multicolored kind of sheet about, uh, look something like this right here, and it will show how how the uh, uh, it, it will show how our assets grow over time, you know. And by I think the assets that we currently have, the actuary is telling us, and this is what I look at when the actuary uh, comes to me and he gives me this information. Uh, I look at it, and the actuary actually says right here. Excuse me, just a second. Let me get my glasses so I can read that. Uh, the market value of the assets in 2053 will be over $62 billion. And that's just the natural progression of the market. Uh, so when I'm seeing that kind of growth over time, as a, pers as a member of the board and I want to vote, I'm wanting to sustain the system for right now, trying to get us, in my opinion, 2033. I appreciate that. And I think based on my research, it, it, there's been three major shocks to the system since night or events, I'll say, maybe not shocks, but uh, with this 25.1 billion liability, one you named was 1998, 99. This legislature, whoever was in this legislature, yeah. voted to give benefits that had not been paid for, which that was their vote. You know, we have to live by it. That's they've bound the state, but that has created, as I understand it, maybe even some of the board members, about four billion of our liability. Yes, so, that so is correct. All right, and, and that's about sixteen percent of right. the twenty-five billion. And and that's a cola. That's the way it is titled. And every time I speak to a retired group, I beg them to use that word and forget those other two words because those other two words sound like a bonus. That's not a bonus. It's a cola. So, um, so that's that's one change to the system. You mentioned the second change, in my opinion, the reduction of. Uh, workforce, the reduction of payroll, that has some numerical uh, value within the PERS unfunded liability. I don't know exactly what that number is, but, but I think that was kind of the point you were making. 
then there's some, I believe I understood you to say, liability that's always going to be there because that's the way a mature plan operates. So we're not expecting, although I'd love to score 100, we're not going to score 100. Um, the third shock, though, and this is where I think the discussion is really concerning, is that we have voted as the PERS board to impose upon ourselves, based on recommendations from people that we pay to advise us, to reduce our rate of return from eight to seven in the recent past, and that is $8 billion approximately of our unfunded liability. And in addition to that, we have shortened the amortization period because that unfunded liability is what we would call debt. As, as was stated, I think, earlier by the first speaker, is that if, hey, if everybody retired today and we had to pay up, we're short this much, you got to come up with it. Well, that's debt. If you... And, and, and if I'm wrong on the amortization, tell me I'm wrong, but I thought used to, we funded, we, we calculated the amortization over 30 years and refied it every year, and now we're doing it on 25 years fixed. Did that also cause the funded liability to fall? Can't answer that question precisely. Okay. Uh, yes, we, we do it that way. Uh, what, 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 I, what I see is the amortization period with what we propose in our tier five and over the next 30 years, because those employees, if we do that and do the, you know, the tier five where there's no 3%, there's no more accumulation of the 3%. And that accumulation is going to have a positive impact on the long term. And we work on 30 years and more. 30 years and more. So I just think that that, but the shocks that you've described are shocks that I recognize to the system as well. Now, I, I will say this, moving that number from 7.55 to seven could be described as a shock. I could also describe it as a more accurate picture of anticipated returns in the future based on the worldwide economy. And I would I could describe it in that manner too, and that would drive the conservatism, I think, of, of actuaries. And, and that's fair, but when you're paying a consultant to help you make decisions, I would want you to make the rate of return as low as humanly possible because then the money managers exceed the expectation. So I'll ask a direct question. I think we spend $100 million or so per year. I know in, in some form I saw it was $0.31 cents per $100. But do we spend about $100 million of PERS retirement people's money on investment people fees? And Okay, we do? That's about $100 million, is that correct? That, right. Okay. And so are there, are, are there any bonuses for them if they exceed the expected rate of return? Uh, no. Okay. No, we don't. It's Good. A flat, it's a flat break. All right. Um, well, I, I really do appreciate your patience. I thank the committee let, for your patience. Me, I've talked the chairman into oblivion, let, apparently. Let me address, there was one other question about actuaries. And, and every five years, we do an actuarial audit of our current actuary. We bring in somebody else to look at his, at his and that firm's process and procedures to see if they are following the standards of the uh, actuaries. And if it's, it's like doing a general audit. And then once what they do is they give us the suggestions as to what they would do different or suggest that they include, uh, that our actuaries include in, in the uh, actuarial system that he is actually using. Okay. So we evaluate him every five years and his firm uh, as well. Well, my last question is dealing with the rate increase. Uh, you talked about the decrease in number of employees. The amount of total increase to the state, agencies, universities, K-12, community colleges, all the people that are state employees is $371 million total. Mm -hmm. and, and the PERS board has adopted that over the next three years to be implemented. The PERS board has also put in their footnotes that another 5% is recommended by the actuaries. 
So that would be almost three quarters of a billion dollars of revenue. If 10 more percent on every state employee payroll doesn't go to the employee, it goes into the retirement system. If we drive that cost all the way to 27.4, as was stated earlier, we're potentially going to lose employees. Has the board factored in that not only would that be a $750 million increase across state government, that it also could cause people to not hire state employees and then you make something worse? We, we have talked about all of what you have described and how it did. Now, in the footnotes, it does say that the actuary did that. Now, I have heard of complaints about us not following the experts. He's an expert, his company. 10%, what did the board do? Said, no, we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna do 5%. And then we spread it out over three years. And we want to wait to see what the real numbers and the impacts are because all of that is done on a projection of last year. And the board said, no, we're gonna wait because we don't think it it, it, it makes sense to go ahead and do that. So in that particular instance, I will say that I voted, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna wait because the only thing that we know for a fact is what happened in the past. That's all we know. And using the best information from Callan about the worldwide stocks and, and how the world is responding in the world economy. And then, and then it goes into a 30 year projection by the actuary, um, as I said, there are some spirited discussions about why and what, and we, and we disagreed and said, no, we're not gonna do anything for three years. I hope your meetings are broadcast and archived like this, because I wanna go watch them. Uh, that's, that's, that's good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your patience, committee, and, and thank you, uh, sir. I think you have a few more questions. Okay. Is it, are you good? Uh, well, I'm I'm good. I'm 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 ready to go. I just wanted to address one. <laughs> we are too. Uh, I just wanted to address one other thing uh, in our in 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 what we had sent this particular bill that kind of brought us here. Uh, one was it rescinded that five percent, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that, which we have done, and I appreciate that. The other thing was a direct infusion of cash. Um, since that 1999, it created that $4 billion li uh, liability. Oh, and I hate the word liability the way we have to use it because it's really $25 billion of what people have already earned and paid into the system, and we kind of owe it to them. And that's the reason I said I came here to be. But the direct infusion of cash, now I'm stepping out of my lane and I apologize. In, 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 before I do this, I do believe that there was one time when the um, highway patrol got into an issue and there was a direct infusion of cash and the direct infusion of cash uh, could, because the only thing since that $4 billion of, of liability was created contributions from the uh, employer has increased and also from the employees. But if there was a direct infusion of cash uh, for that unfunded liability that was generated there, if we could figure out a way to get some, some of a direct infusion of cash over time, that would relieve some of the pressure I believe on the on the system as well, and and as I said, I don't I can't remember what that two percent actually is statewide, but if if, if we had a, oh, I can't remember the exact, but the direct infusion would create that uh, lessen the pressure as well. And, and just to make sure to that, uh, I believe the two percent a little over 100 million, between 100 and 150 million somewhere. But um, so there's two parts there that we're looking at. One is the cash flow 
which which like last year was cash flow positive. The other part of that is the time value of money and assets of putting cash in to grow the assets and letting it compound over time. So there's two parts to that is the way I understand that because anytime we cash flow positive, uh, we have extra cash, but a cash infusion then would be building. Am I correct in understanding that? Uh, say that last part again. Uh, a cash infusion would, would not necessarily be for the cash flow if we already cash flow positive in a year. It would be for the long-term benefit of compounding. Uh, I would say yes, but don't hold me to that. Well, well, if you don't mind, we have three senators with, I, I think, just one or two questions each. Do you mind answering them? Do you mind answering a few more questions from a few more senators? All right, Senator McCon, I know has a question. Yeah. Oh. Well, I appreciate you being here and I've looked at all the peer reports as you brought up. I think you brought up about peer being one of your most important assets when you came on the board. And in, if you know, if you look at peer, peer consistently says um, that there exists a contractual relationship between the employer members of PERS and the state. This relationship also exists between retirees and the state and an employee's contractual rights accrue at the time of employment. That is consistently in all the peer reports that are out there. And you, you are the senior member of the ones that are here testifying. So I've got to ask you this question. I've reviewed the peer reports back to 2012 and we have years in which they brought in that we were uh, the 80% figure would not be reached and was actually funded at 51.6%. And then it jumps from that point to 80% the next year to 95.8% to 67.6% to 93.5% and to 48.6%. I'm not your numbers guy. I'm the attorney and the cattle farmer. So I look at things a little more simplistic. And my question is with the, variety just in 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 that short period of time since 2012 2014 were was there ever a time period that you were more concerned about where we're headed with the 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 uh the trust itself and the the funding in 2047 or 2043 or 2042 which are some of the numbers that are in here did that ever you know tee you up a little bit more uh, instead of waiting until we were at 94% that dropped that to 48.6% and now at 56.1%. You're the senior member. At what point did that ever trigger you? And I realize this has been an ongoing issue since Doug Davis and others that have been here in, th in this chamber, and it's a hard issue to talk about, but it's time to talk about it. So that, that's a question I want to ask you. It would concern me if there were a number of consecutive years. If there is an economic disaster worldwide, not only is FERS going to have to make change, but everybody is going to have to make changes. The fluctuation and volatility of the stock market, and since we you get about 55% of our revenue from the stocks, the equities, the all of that sort of stuff. It would have to be a number of times, and to me, it would have to approach what I would call imminent danger of collapse. And that is, is when I would think that we would have to take drastic action. Imminent claim, to, uh, the, one of the liaisons that sits with us says, well, how do you define it? I said, I've been trying to get the actuary to define that for 11 years for me now. That's what I want to know. Can we agree that we're probably not at the point of imminent collapse? We're not at the point of imminent we, collapse. We are not. There okay. A, I think that needs to be brought out and told to the public is that at the end of the day, you're contractually obligated these benefits. We are not collapsing. Henny penny, the sky is not falling. But if we don't discuss this, it gets further and further down the line. And we owe it to our generations ahead. I owe it to my new kid to make sure that in the future, if he gets in the system, that he is able to rely on it. Based on the numbers that I currently see and the cash flow projections and the uh, uh, 
projections that are going to begin to occur in 2033 through 36, it would be in that time frame that I would be looking and wanting to see precisely what's happening. Very quickly in our tier four is where all of the employees are gonna be. Uh, right. And then if we do the tier five, that will start that other tier. So uh, I think that it, it, in 2033 through 36, if, if the uh, unfunded liability and the assets get much more out of kelter, then, then we may be forced to take some other kind of action. But there is a, a y'all, this is, this is a, is a stochastic, uh, stochastic projection that the actuary use. Those are big words. Remember, I'm the cattle farmer it's over a, here. It's now, a wild okay. guess. Okay. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I, what, what that is, is the actuary's way of saying what percentage is there uh, that, that how, how, how good a shape are we in? If what we have proposed in tier five and the increase, it, uh, he tells us that we're 80% solvent through 2053. Well, and I appreciate that, but I also see in years past that we've been 94%, we've been 80%, we've been 93.5. I just question where we really are. And, and I guess, let me just, just conclude with this, is that I see also in the reports that uh, in, from 09 to 2019, we saw a 36% decrease in the number of state employees that were within the system. The most basic most basic level I can ask this question right now it doesn't even include it involve the, the employees there. It involves the fact that we just said that there was seven hundred million dollars that's not in a deficit that is over the amounts needed. If we actually have cash flow coming into that level, why are we putting a two percent addition back on our cities, counties, towns? because I'm afraid that the detrimental effect is gonna be reduction in employees in the system because school districts are going to go to contractual labor as are others. We don't want to, we as a board, no, I'd never speak for the board. I as an individual, I don't wanna do anything that's gonna hinder the services that are coming to the people. I don't wanna do anything that's gonna drive people away. I don't want to do anything that's going to drive people to retirement and change that projection as well because that creates pressure. I don't want to do any of that. So I'm saying we're nowhere near, based on the numbers that the actuary has given to us today and through his best estimation, and he is the expert of what that is. Now, I've just told you there are 17 things out there that we don't control. And any of those changes. Oh, and the biggest driver of that, of course, is inflation. And y'all know nationwide what we're struggling with with inflation. Inflation and and the uh, uh, to get to the 7%. But I want to go back to that 7% one more time. Since we have ripped the Band-Aid off and just gone 7%, now, technically, in my East Tupelo, Mississippi boy thinking, if we have more revenue that comes in than that 7%, since we don't have these other things, that's going to be going towards reducing our loss because it will be in assets. We will have purchased other assets that will build that side of the equation. So that's just my... You, you go back to 7%. I want to go back to the fact you, you are the old hat here. And, and it did start at 7.75% somewhere in there on those peer reports. That was a re, uh, recommendation reduced to 7.5. And now we're jumping to the seven now. Did you see any changes when you voted or you were the recommendation to go from 7.75 to 7.5 to start with? Or do you remember that being in your tenure? I think we're gonna stay at 7% because that's what's worldwide if that's what you're asking. Okay, thank you.
I think two more. Now, wait, that's, I'm not speaking for the board and I'm not speaking for anybody <laughs> else. I'm just saying right now, what I look at it, that's, we're there. And, oh, and let me show you, I voted against some of these things, but I'm going to tell you, in general, I supported them and I'm going to support the board what we have said because that's ultimately where we need to be is just getting there a little faster than I wanted to do it personally. Yeah. Senator Parker. Thank you, Mr. McCoy. And uh, I think we proved that number two was the best number to draw um, in the in the questioning. Um, but um, I just want to uh, just kind of expound just a little bit. And, you know, my hope is that you just with these questions can just give a quick answer, because I understand you've been up here a long time. And as somebody who stands up at podiums a long time, it, it is not any fun. Um, you, you mentioned that you were not in favor of moving down to the 7%. Uh, and there's been discussion about how that move down to 7% has definitely affected our drop below 60% and the need for the 2% that's being asked for now uh, by, by the PERS board. So if we had kept that higher, is it not true that we maybe at this time would not have to ask a school system like mine for an extra $4.3 million a year for their 2%? That's just the 2% for the school system that I represent. So, so I, I guess my direct question is, you, is there or can there be any discussion on the board of you did go back and you discussed, okay, we're not gonna phase in 5% all at once, but you did make a move from 7.75 to then 7.55 and then made the giant leap down to seven. Is there a possibility that your board could go back and say, hey, this was maybe a larger leap than, than we expected based on the conversation, the dialogue that we've gotten here. And is there a chance that you could revisit that just as a simple yes or no question? I don't think that we can delay anything that we have recommended in my opinion, or me. I don't want to delay anything because we do, it just puts us further behind. Even, even though when you voted, you voted against that, correct? I did. I, okay. I, I think it still puts us further behind because the worldwide economy is. And, and, and I do understand that. And I, and, you know, and I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. I'm just trying to just, you know, drill down on just a couple of points here, you know, but, but, but if the board did make that decision, that might move the needle slightly in, in the direction that might help not just, you know, our retirees feel stronger and, and better, but we also, we want to make our, our cities and you know our superintendents and the school systems as they exist right now uh, feel a little bit better. So, so I would just if if your answer is you cannot do that, uh, I understand that and I'll I'll take you at that answer. But I do think a lot of times we as a legislature revisit things. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you that we we talked about earlier with Miss Hannah is is in all of this there's been there's been so much talk today about the actuary and the actuary and the decision of the actuary and the actuary is saying this and that and you know and the actuary is not in this room you know it's somebody we can talk to would it help to have a few more people on the board say maybe three who were long-range planners who maybe could be like an actuary who just are there every single meeting with you to kind of dig kind of dive into some of these issues more and and not be somebody who, you know, kind of just, you know, zooms in with you or, or meets with you in passing, but is actually there meeting with you and is not taking away, you know, your board membership in any way, shape or form in the, the fashion. But, but the, the big point that I want to have come out of our chairman's meetings today is that we would like to try to help your board in any way, shape or fashion that we can to uh, get the advice they need so that we don't have those rates of returns changing to Senator McCann's point where it's hard for us to understand and that maybe we get some some expertise or um, uh, additional insight there. Would you would you be willing to um, have some extra input or expertise on the board uh, in, in any fashion? Okay, I've got a two-part answer for you, I believe. And the first part is, I am stepping out of the role as a board member. Yes, sir. I am 
certainly just a taxpaying citizen, just like all 360,000 of the PERS members are taxpayers and pay city and county and school taxes, all that. So what I would say is that there are boards across the United States that have uh, uh, built into their system uh, not board members, but advisors that, that actually uh, come and uh, give either input or questions or to try to do that. As far as I know, those kinds of advisors uh, work. I don't know if they don't work or whatever, but boards have those. Would I be personally threatened by that? I would not. The thing that concerns me, not as a board member, but as a taxpaying PERS retiree, is not having direct input who sits on that board. And if, and if I don't get to vote for the representative, that's what bothers me. Now, stepping back over here, I'm, I'm not going to be intimidated by anybody that comes in there. If I'm a member of the 10 member board and we've got advice that are coming from advisors that are designed to help us in specific areas, then I'm going to accept their expertise just like I would accept the Callan on the stocks and helping us manage our, our money managers and the uh, Kavanaugh McDonald, our, our actuary. I would accept that exactly the same way and I would review all of that data with the same intensity and same level of concentration and thoughtfulness that I would any other. So at, as a board, are there, are there any of the actuaries or the people you've mentioned that if given an opportunity for your board to vote on, you know, as your membership and representative, is there any one of those right now that you speak with and talk to all the time that you as a board would vote to add to your board as a voting member? Uh, the only people that I talk to primarily are the people that are employed by us, Kavanaugh and Allen, uh, and then uh, that's and then our executive director and our internal staff. So I don't, if I understood, I don't. So, so I, I guess my question would be, you know, your, your point was that you would prefer to have the members and I would consider the eight of you to be the members who would vote on that. If, if you don't have one of the people that were paying a hundred million dollars a year, each year right now, that you would be comfortable, the eight of you appointing to that board, you know, through your, process of you know achieving that um i would i would contend that it might be uh better suited if we just look to find someone with specific skill sets to add there someone who's perhaps say a certified long-range planner who deals with you know long-range pension plans or somebody who also could come along there but 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 i do understand your point i do understand your two-tiered method but but is there any other help other than the financial advice help that you've demonstrated would definitely be appreciated that we could give you. I would appreciate any help that we could be given for this board uh, who has three people with doctorates, two attorneys, six uh, accountants, uh, former commissioner right. uh, have outperformed the our peer group for the last 15 years and to beat the three, five. I don't know how we as a board or any other board proper could do. And, and I think you, I think you misunderstand my question. Would, my question is not, you know, I not personally, I would not reject any help. Right. You know, so, and, and I profoundly appreciate your experience and I think you've done a great job of testifying today. Uh, you have personally for me, I raise my confidence, you know, in the decision making of the board. And, and I think the eight of you, if the three of the members that are here today 
a representative of the five that are not here. Uh, I, I think you've uh, gone through a good election process. I think your members have selected some good representatives for you, but uh, but but I would like to you know visit with you more to see what other help we could give you. And and I think that's the the purpose the chairman had of this meeting was to try to move in that direction. But thank you for yielding for the questions. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. One one last thing. Yes. Good. I think you have two more people who have questions. I'm, no, I'm, I'm all <laughs> Okay. Do we have any other questions? I, I, like, uh, let me Senator Brannon has two Please. quick questions. I think Senator Blunt has a question. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. McCoy, thank you for your service to the state and on this board and the other speakers. Thank you so much for coming and enduring this and, and just helping us to get a better grasp of, of the issues and helping us make sure that we have factual information. You mentioned earlier that uh, we, we certainly understand that, that your decisions are based on a lot of actuarial type information. You mentioned earlier that there is an audit that is performed of the actuary's work. Do you have a copy or is there a way that this committee could see that information? It's all public information. Uh, we would have to get the director to get the last one of those that was done. Uh, and and it, it is very much like an audit of, of books you, you will have just uh, things that say, uh, this procedure I would have done differently. It's not in violation of the standards, but I would have done this or I would have done that. And that it's very much like an audit of your books, how, how that turns out. Thank you. I'd be interested to see that. And that's the only question I had for you. Thank you. Can I turn around and touch the, the, okay. And one last senator has a question. Yeah. I, I appreciate you, uh, Senator Blunt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief because I know it's late and I was going to ask you something after I just raised a point with Dr. McCoy. Uh, I think this has helped me and I hope the public understand uh, what the board's uh, powers are and to what extent the board is simply following the law that the legislature has passed. I appreciate Senator McCon raising the point that I believe the state has a contractual obligation to our retirees for the benefits that they've earned. Uh, the board does not set those benefits. The board cannot adjust those benefits. The board by law has to write those checks. And the only thing that I believe the board can do, and I've, uh, as the only Senator on the committee appointed by the Lieutenant governor as an ex officio board member, I've enjoyed getting to know you and the other members of the board who are here and gone to every meeting, I think for the past two plus years. What I, what I've seen is the only thing the board can do is based on the projected benefits that are to be paid that are set by this legislature uh, and the money that's coming in from employees, employers, and the money you make with your investments is, is to pay those investments, or pay those benefits rather, and recommend to the legislature uh, an employer contribution increase. And that's what the board did and has recommended phasing that in over a three-year period. We executed our duty by using the only quiver, uh, only arrow that we have in our quiver, which is to raise the contribution rate in order to achieve the uh, results that, that we think needs to happen. And if anybody who's in the legislature has any problem with any of that, then that's on the legislature to change the law because you're just following the law that we've written and the governor signed. And so do you recall, I think you're the longest serving member uh, on the board, do you recall any other time when the legislature by statute has prohibited uh, employers from paying the recommendation of the board as it relates to the employer contribution? I'm going to have to get a little closer to you to hear that. I lost 70. Let, let me ask you, I, 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 let me ask you again. I'll try to, I'll do my best. Well, no, I think I, I think, uh, I think everybody needs to hear this. Can you, re <laughs> can you recall the legislature ever expressly prohibiting by statute employers uh, from paying the recommendation that the board has adopted? The answer is I have not. That's my only question. I know it's late, Mr. Chairman, and before we had, uh, uh, break up the meeting, I was just going to ask you if you could speak to what your intentions are with regard to House Bill 1590 this session? Well, today is just a hearing, and we wanted to gather information. 
Uh, I am not aware of anybody on this committee who had spoken with anyone on the board. And so this was a great opportunity for us to hear from you, um, gain some insight into uh, what your role is on the board um, and, and what challenges the PERS system faces, what role you play in that, what role we play in that. And so um, at this time, we're not prepared to vote on a bill. Uh, we, this was strictly informational. And so we appreciate greatly y'all being here today. Uh, we're happy that, um, that you made the time to come spend with us a little bit more time than I expected, but thank you very much. And, and um, with that, I entertain a motion, Roger report. Roger report.